So obviously a normal person doesn't make as many videos as I do. So what the heck's going on? And uh, I think it all goes down to connection. If you, if you connect normally, you probably don't make as many videos as I do. And uh, we often learn how to connect from our parents. And so if you didn't learn to connect with your parents in your first few years, very likely don't get that wiring to connect naturally and normally uh, from early childhood. And so loneliness doesn't really have to do with how many people are in your life. Uh, I think it's, once again, it's a symptom of, of just lack of connection. And uh, even even if you're in a room full of people, you can feel very lonely. And that's like the worst loneliness of all, when you're in a room full of people and uh, you feel lonely. And that's happened to me a lot. And here's what typically has gone through my head in those situations. I start thinking, is there anyone here who cares about me? And then, when I relayed that to my therapist a few years ago, my therapist said, well, do you care about anyone? I was like, oof. Like, do I care about anyone in the room? Like, I'm thinking, I'm here, okay? But uh, what about me? Do I care about anyone there? And uh, my therapist, a few years ago, as part of my healing process, encouraged me to try caring about other people. Uh, I'll give you... I'll give you a line from my second grade report card. So, I only really began regular school in second grade. I went to a little bit of kindergarten when we were in England, but uh, my parents believed in delaying side of your formal education so I only started proper in second grade and I, I think on my first report card the teacher wrote Luke is always very eager to share his opinions with the class but he needs to learn to be more tolerant of the slower thinker so as you could see right there that uh, I was going to be a future YouTube streamer one day always very eager to share my opinions but needs to learn to be more tolerant of the slower thinker so my lack of tolerance for the slower thinkers did not endear me to other students and as a result i often felt lonely i remember we moved to california from australia in uh, June of 1977 and I was introduced to uh, some of my f future classmates in sixth grade at the Pacific Union College pool and as soon as I met these kids the first thing I did was I started splashing water in their faces and, and their immediate reaction was like who is this guy like there was a there was a nice introduction made and I responded by smacking water into their faces, uh, which has been a bit of a, a lifelong habit. And so, do you think uh, that endeared me to them? That made me feel, made them feel like, oh, I really want to get to know Luke Ford. Seems like a great guy. Like, did, did that create, you know, an opening for connection? No, not really it kind of started the precedent that uh, I would be a guy with a scathing sense of humor and a sarcastic and a challenge. Uh, my, my high school journalism teacher, perhaps closer to him than any other teacher in high school, he, he wrote in my high school yearbook, no other student has challenged me as much as you have. And uh, I hope that you've learned to become a gentleman. <laughs> Poor guy, he even unfriended me on Facebook a few years ago. I think I, well, I know I made the mistake of posting a, a, a link to my blog on his wall. 
and he must have reacted like, who the heck is this guy? Like, I don't need this. And so I had several teachers who told me I was the most challenging student they ever had. And people who are challenging, doesn't it really make you want to get close to them? So because I didn't know how to connect with myself, with other people and guide in my higher purpose, I, I was always keeping people at arm's length. And with sarcasm, with scathing remarks, we put verbal aggression by splashing water in their faces. Come on, let's go. I got streaming to do. I got prep. I got a four o'clock show with Kevin Michael Grace on the Red Hen incident with Sarah uh, Sanders and uh, the, the coming Civil War. Man, this guy's a jerk. What the fuck? Okay. So, uh, one of the kids that I'd splashed in the face with, with water when I was uh, Pacific Union College pool uh, in, in eighth grade, when my dad was being sent to Washington DC to defend his theological views, uh, one of the kids was told by his mother to invite me home for lunch. So I wasn't often invited to people's homes for Sabbath lunch because of the chip on my shoulder because of my verbal aggression. And he said, no way. And uh, he, he didn't want to expose himself to more scathing. So his mother made him invite me to lunch. And uh, it was one of the happiest memories of my life. Like I was with this normal, healthy, you know, reasonably happy family where there was a lot of joking and kidding around and good boundaries and uh, there was like more more freedom in what you could eat. I had a very restricted diet in in my home, and, and it was like everything was kind of micromanaged. And, uh, this was just like a happy home, and it was, it was an amazing experience. You could you could joke about things that you couldn't joke about in my home. You could joke about girls in the class, and liking girls, and and that was strictly out. I remember when a girl once made the mistake of calling my home. Uh, like my mother, like told her off, said like, Luke can't talk to girls. This was like seventh grade. Can you imagine how embarrassing that was? And uh, the girl got the message. She never called again. And I, I remember my mother, meaning my stepmother, running down the the driveway saying, Luke, who's Jeannie? Who's Jeannie Clark? I said, oh, it's just a girl from my class. And she said, she called and you know, you're not allowed to talk to girls. My, my, when my brother, Got a couple of girlfriends at about age 14. My my father marched over to their home and, and broke up the relationship. They were uh, they were too young to be together. But in this uh, in this Muth home at Pacific Union College, uh, about uh, November of 1979, you could you could laugh about these things. You could joke about these things. You could talk about these things. And uh, it's just it really brought down the, the tension level. And it was just one of the happiest memories of my life. Like I connected to this family and they played a big role in my life to the present day. But uh, particularly over the next five years through, through eighth grade and high school, they often let me stay with them uh, so I could finish off eighth grade with my class. I was dreading having to go to Washington DC with my parents and having to start at a new class halfway through eighth grade. And uh, when I was around the, the Muth family, my, my weirdness and my scathing, uh, it, it calmed down a bit. My whole central nervous system calmed down, which, which was a wonderful thing. It, it kind of filled that hole in my soul, uh, that, that desire for connection. But the problem was it, it always would end and then I'd have to go back to, to my home and and I found that comparatively cold and not a particularly uh, loving place. 
Man, I'm trying to get a good iPhone holder. And this one, like all the others, is not not really doing the job. Even though I, I jammed a, uh, a door stop into the into the holder to try to keep this. Okay, let's see how we do here. So, in the end, loneliness is not something that can be filled by other people. Loneliness is something that gets written into your brain circuitry and uh, stem the, the loneliness. And it would work at times for the first few months of a romantic relationship that would kind of fill the void in my soul, but that never lasts. In the final analysis, you have to you have to do the work to rewire your brain so that you learn to connect normally with yourself, with other people, and, and with God. Because as long as you're ill at ease in yourself, as long as you have failed to clean up the wreckage of your past, as long as you have failed to make amends to the people you have hurt, you're not going to be at ease with yourself. You're not going to feel good about yourself, and that's going to radiate out. We all exert a force field. And uh, whatever's going on with us, it just radiates out. And people pick up on it. People get the signals fast. So until you learn to calm down your own central nervous system, you know, other people will get the sense that you're ill at ease with yourself. And they'll keep, they'll keep a distance. They won't feel comfortable around you. So there, there are lots of ways that you can start to calm down your central nervous system. You can do the Alexander Technique. Uh, you can meditate. You can be around people with secure attachment styles. So someone with a secure attachment style is, is wired to connect with other people and feels comfortable connecting with others and uh, doesn't go around needlessly blowing up relationships and like that can, that can influence you. Uh, probably even having having your own kids, you can you can kind of redo the the problems with your own childhood through uh, having children, loving your children, uh, paying attention to your children, and giving to your children the things that you didn't get when you were a child. So there are all these ways that we can rewire our brains. Uh, psychotherapy, you can learn to connect with a psychotherapist, someone that you can tell your deepest, darkest thoughts to, and is a safe person, who's not going to mock you for it. Uh, a sponsor in 12-step, someone that uh, you talk to on a regular basis, that you do step work with, that you share your moral inventory with, your, your list of people that you have to make amends to, your nine-step list. Uh, someone who gives you guidance on how to make amends. Uh, someone who who uh, lives the life of recovery that you want. So the, there are all these ways that one can learn to rewire the brain towards more secure attachment. On the other hand, you can get around people who are going to make your anxiety worse. Okay, you can get around unhealthy, abusive people who can you can tear you down, reduce whatever level of secure attachment you have, and turn you into an anxious or avoidant. But uh, they can dramatically increase your anxiety. Someone who yells at you, who's like always looking for the flaws in you, uh, someone who's volatile, someone who's not predictable. Being around someone like that is going to make you more anxious, going to make you feel more that there's something broken and irredeemably bad about you. So the people we're around just have a profound effect on us. Some people make us feel horrible. Some people make us feel great. Like someone like David Suisa, the editor and publisher of the Jewish Journal. Being around David Suisa just makes you feel amazing. He just lifts up everyone that he's around. He's a joy. And uh, we can be like that. It's, it's possible we can become someone who will lift up other people 
make other people feel good, feel inspired, feel connected to their best selves. Or we can tear people down. We can, uh, uh, we can be volatile, we can be unpredictable. As, you know, as we affect others, they affect us. And by, by choosing the extent that we can, sane, healthy people to be around is gonna have a profound effect on us. You can choose a particular synagogue or church which is filled with healthy people, or you can choose a synagogue or church which is filled with vituperative, angry, nasty people. You can choose, you know, volunteer organizations which are filled with generous people, or you can choose volunteer organizations filled with nasty people. And uh, whoever you spend time around is going to affect you. But yeah, you can rewire your psyche. I feel I like myself now. I've, I've learned to become a good friend to myself. My psychotherapist talked about that for years, but I never really understood what does it mean to be a good friend to yourself. These days, most of the time, I'm a good friend to myself. I'm at ease with myself. Other people pick that up. And so connecting with other people in a superficial way or deeper, more intense ways is a lot easier these days. And uh, that assuages the loneliness. But of course, there are still there's some neural pathways that I have not healed yet. Bye-bye.